Our gospel reading comes from Luke's gospel, um, Mary's song, that is, is often spoken about. And Mary said, my, pro my soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you, my Savior. For you have looked with favor upon your lowly servant, and from this day forward all generations will call me blessed. For you, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. Your mercy reaches from age to age for those who fear you. You have shown strength with your arm. You have scattered the proud and their conceits. You have deposed the mighty from their thrones and raised the lowly to high places. You have filled the hungry with good things while you sent the rich away empty. You have come to the aid of Israel, your servant, mindful of your mercy, the promise you made to our ancestors, to Sarah and Abraham and their descendants forever. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. In this season of Advent, we often turn our ears, our hearts, and our imaginations to the words of the prophets. The prophets, the ones who told and who tell of the coming of the one who will call God's people to prepare the way of the Lord, to make straight their own paths, and to usher in God's kingdom of love and justice, mercy, humility, and righteousness. The prophets are covenantal lawyers, if you will. They bring charges against God's people for how they have lost their way and call them back to love the ways of God and remind us that one is indeed coming. And in our case, one has already come to establish a kingdom a beloved community of people who embody justice, equity, welcome, and inclusion for all. In this season of Advent, we attune our ears to these prophets to hear a word of this coming and emerging kingdom and beloved community. And if we have ears to hear, we too might confess and repent of our waywardness and wait and work for the Advent of justice. Justice is perhaps one of the strongest and most consistent and pervasive themes of the prophets and a hallmark of what it means to be a part of God's kingdom and God's beloved community. As Pastor Patrice read for us just a moment ago from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah says about God, I the Lord love justice. I don't know about you, but I don't often bring together the word love and justice. But God is a God who loves justice. God has come and is coming fully to establish justice on the earth as it is in heaven. If you're like me, you might be wondering, well, what do you mean by justice, BJ? Justice is a complicated and rich and difficult word to define. What does justice look like? Well, for our conversation today, I simply want to use the words of Dr. Cornell West, who says, justice is what love looks like in public. Justice is what love looks like in public. Friends, Jesus has come and is coming through the church. And one of the hallmark signs of the coming of Christ is justice. Love in public. An exhibition of love in action and in public, empowering the poor, disadvantaged, and neglected to participate in the wealth and resources of the larger human community. Jesus has come and is coming through us, the church, with a love that advocates for the vulnerable, marginal, and people without resources. 
Jesus has come and is coming through us, the church, by establishing a beloved community who loves justice and are called to exhibiting it in public in the here and now in the situations that we find ourselves. Isaiah speaks of this in some great detail. Good news for the poor. Freedom to people who are captive. Release of prisoners from their darkness. Comforting those who mourn and grieve. Building up and repairing ruined cities. And then smack in the middle of this prophetic and visionary promise, Isaiah says that he will proclaim and establish the year of the Lord's favor. Now, if you don't read the book of Leviticus, which many people don't, if you're struggling to sleep some night, I encourage you to read the book of Leviticus. But in the middle, in the 25th chapter of the book of Leviticus, God tells God's people about the year of the Lord's favor. It's also called the year of Jubilee. And Isaiah says that when the one who comes that will establish justice, this one will institute the year of the Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee. Well, you might ask, what happens, BJ, on the year of Jubilee? Well, let me tell you. Every seven years, the land and the animals are supposed to rest, take a whole year off. And then every seven times seven, which is what? Okay, good. Just making sure you're awake. On the 50th year, so the year after the 49th year, God's people are to sound a trumpet and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all of its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan, and the 50th year shall be called a jubilee year for you. So, if you had lost property in some kind of economic transaction or it had been stolen from you, every 50 years the opportunity is enabled, if God's people were to practice this, it is returned to you. If you have since died, it gets returned to your next of kin. In the midst of this, debts are also canceled. So if you have student loan debt or credit card debt, okay, they didn't have those back then, but you have debt. The debts are canceled. Friends, economics, money, and land are at the heart of of justice. God built into the very fabric of a beloved community a practice to ensure that land would be shared and redistributed equitably every 50 years. And the purpose of this justice, love lived out in public, a community wide restoration of stability, security, and well-being to all, particularly ensuring that the poor and the disadvantaged and the marginalized were taken care of, so that the gap between rich and poor, the haves and the have-nots, have -nots, did not become systemic injustice, and love would be lived out in public. Friends, this indeed is good news for the poor, freedom for the captives, release for prisoners, comfort for those who've been grieving and mourning, and the rebuilding and repairing of things that have been destroyed. Is it not? You can answer that question. This act of justice is a concrete manifestation of what love looks like in public enabling the poor and disadvantaged and neglected through the redistribution of land from the wealthy and powerful so all can participate in the wealth and resources of the human community. And it reminds us that the land is never just ours, nor privately owned or something to be possessed simply by individuals so we can do what we want with it, extract what we want from it. Rather, the land is a gift from our Creator to be shared interdependently with others, just like the skies and the seas. 
And yet, for me, as someone who has never experienced those physical, economic, and land realities, the flip side is also hard news for those who are wealthy and privileged and have means. For in order for the year of Jubilee to happen, for justice to come, we have to open our hands and release. Mary got this. She understood it. She understood her lineage and her heritage that when one comes, this promised one who is in her body, growing within her, the God-bearer filled with the Holy Spirit speaks and sings strikingly similar words to Isaiah's. Mary knew that the long-awaited one had to come dwell, who, who came to dwell in her was going to act powerfully to bring justice, to see God's love lived out in public, turning power structures upside down just like the year of Jubilee scattering the proud and powerful rulers from their thrones so that the humble can be lifted up, sending the rich away empty by filling the hungry with good things. Mary realizes that she is the most intimate participant in the fulfillment of God's promise of a community-wide restoration of stability, security, and well-being for all people, but particularly those like herself who were vulnerable. And the realization of this reality that is happening to her in her body causes her spirit to rejoice. She is filled with great joy, worship, praise, adoration, and thanksgiving for God and God's faithfulness from generation to a generation to establish justice on earth as it is in heaven. And little did Mary know on that day when she penned these words, that her son Jesus would begin his public ministry some 30 years later by uttering the very words of Isaiah to the religious leaders. Jesus, the promised one, would open the Torah and recite these very words about God's justice for the poor, the imprisoned, the captives, and the grieving. And after reading it, he would simply roll up the scroll set it down, walk to his seat and sit down. And scripture tells us when he did this, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened upon him. And then Jesus says to them, today, in the hearing of this scripture, it is fulfilled. I am the embodiment of the God of justice. And God is a God who loves justice and has come in Jesus and is a coming in and through us, his church, by grace to bring justice on the earth as it is in heaven. The Spirit of the Lord is upon the church to announce and enact in public good news for the poor, freedom to the captives, release to prisoners from their darkness, comfort for those who mourn, and proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, canceling debts and returning land to its owners. Ponder this with me for a moment. What if the second coming of Jesus is not just some catalytic apocalyptic event. What if the coming of Jesus is happening right now in you, in me, in the collective us, the church of Jesus Christ? Where in this world do you see the need for justice, for love to be manifested publicly? Where do you feel called to advocate for the vulnerable and the marginal and the people without resources to act out and exhibit your love of God in public? Where might God be inviting you to have your riches and your power and your influence and your privilege be used to flip the script and bring justice in this world? I can feel the butterflies in my stomach 
at this moment. As I sat with this text, these texts this week, I could not escape my own conviction in my own heart to speak about something in particular, what is happening in Gaza. And I want to say I recognize by focusing in on one aspect of injustice, I run the risk of being misunderstood and alienating my Jewish siblings. And yet it is a risk I feel I must take. For as Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. As of yesterday, 18,787 Palestinians have been killed by Israel's war on Hamas. Out of 2.3 million people in Gaza, 1.9 million individuals are currently displaced and over 50% of the buildings in Gaza have literally been destroyed. According to the Catholic Church just yesterday, the Israel Defense Force murdered two Christian women inside the Holy Family Parish in Gaza, where the majority of Christian families had taken refuge since the start of the war. Nadia and her daughter Samar were shot and killed as they walked to the sisters' convent. One was killed as she tried to carry the other to safety. Also, just yesterday, a rocket fired from the Israel Defense Force tank targeted the covenant of the missionaries of charity. And if you don't know that name, that is Mother Teresa's missionary agency. And the covenant was home to over 54 disabled persons and is a part of the church compound, which was signaled as a place of worship since the beginning of war. And now these 54 disabled people are currently displaced and without access to respirators that some need to survive. Friends, these are just two stories of the injustice and atrocities being committed in this moment let alone the historic atrocities upon Palestinian peop people. And while I personally condemn all acts of terror and violence, including actions of Hamas, and I grieve and ache with Israeli families as they await the return of their loved ones, I want to close by reading a portion of a letter from a Palestinian Christian urging us, the church, his siblings, a man of our own faith tradition, to listen to the story of Palestinians. He says this, Growing up in Palestine as a third generation refugee, I would wait with anticipation each year during the Christmas Eve Mass for the singing of the Arabic hymn on Christmas night. The hymn promises that on Christmas Eve, and I'm quoting the hymn now, hatred will vanish, the earth will bloom, war will be buried, and love will be born. This hymn is deeply personal to me. Singing it made me feel seen and heard as a Palestinian by acknowledging the decade-long suffering and injustices we have endured. It directly attacks the very notion of war and points to acts of love and compassion as the only path in overcoming hate. This is easier said than done, and yet it is essential for understanding the true meaning of Christmas. Sadly, Christmas, this Christmas, the hymn's promises seem painfully far-fetched as Palestinians continue to be subjected to the most intense escalation of violence we have ever seen. For years, I have found that the Advent and Christmas story par parallels the Palestinian experience. Mary and Joseph's displacement to Bethlehem from Nazareth, the closing of all doors that would grant Mary the dignity of giving birth to the Son of God, and the forcible postpartum transfer of the couple to Egypt. Mary, like many Palestinian mothers, was resilient in the face of a systemic a system that discriminated against her and her newborn child. Like so many mothers in Palestine, she would also later experience the tragic loss of her son, who fell victim to an unholy alliance of corrupt religion, violent imperial power, self-interest, and greed. Today, 
our suffering intensifies and we fear that despair and hopelessness will overtake us. Palestinians, children, mothers, fathers, young and old continue to be denied their most basic human right to even exist. The continuous dehumanization of the entire indigenous population in Palestine leaves many defeated and speechless, myself included. And yet, the lack of attention taken to protect the innocent lives challenges our collective human morality. And yet now, more than ever, we are charged with embodying the true meaning of Christmas through actions of love, justice, compassion, and support. Fellow Christians, we must undertake our individual and collective responsibility for bringing an end to all suffering, all suffering, and the elimination of injustice. Only by our determination to live and act with selfless love can we restore hope to those most in need of security, water, food, shelter, dignity, and the right to simply be, to exist, to live, and to prosper. Friends, I wonder what this means for us and for you this morning. I wonder what celebrating Christmas feels like knowing that this is happening in our world. Someone said to me after the journey service this morning, I was listening to Christmas carols and baking cookies yesterday before he heard this message and just said, this doesn't seem right. And this is the Sunday in Advent where we focus on joy. My sense is that our joy should be curbed ever so slightly or perhaps even dramatically. Because the joy that came to Isaiah and the joy that comes to Mary is a realization that the script will be flipped. A realization that the poor will be lifted up. That those who are held captive will be released that broken and devastated cities will be rebuilt. And right now, where we sit in this moment, that is not the case. And we believe in one who is the Prince of Peace, who is the source of our joy. So let us find a glimmer of hope and peace and joy to inspire our action in the midst of this Advent and Christmas season. Let us listen to the heart of this Palestinian Christian. Let us pray and march and write and call our political leaders who are funding this violence. Let us speak out like Isaiah and Mary and her son, born a Palestinian. For we are their people and they are ours. For those who have ears to hear, may it be so. Amen.